If you play commander long enough, you're going to run into that game. End of turn, destroy your commander. Oh, again your opponent groans? Why do you keep destroying my commander? Sorry, you shrug. My deck doesn't work as long as your commander's in play. Meanwhile, at the other end of the table, your two other opponents are laughing all the way to the bank. Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we have another lesson from CEDH. CEDH is a metagame within the Commander format that sits at one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. Not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames. But there are lessons to learn from how people are using some of the most powerful cards in the history of Magic. Today, we're going to be talking about what can be a really frustrating experience in Commander. Bad matchups. If you came to Commander from 60 and 4 Competitive Magic, you probably already have a good idea what this episode will be about. Before we get started, just wanted to thank you for tuning in for this episode. If you enjoy it, don't forget to like, or 5 star, or thumbs up, or whatever your particular app does for you when you're consuming this content. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and throw us a subscription if you'd enjoyed some of this content. I would also like to say I will officially be going to Oktoberfest in Philadelphia, November's 18th through the 20th. If you're going to be there, let us know. I'm excited to meet more people from the community. Monarch puts on some really fantastic events, and I will tell you from personal experience, the CDH scene in Philadelphia is fantastic. Now, without further ado, let's start talking about bad matchups. And I guess, as usual, it would be helpful to kind of understand what makes a bad matchup actually a bad matchup? What makes a bad matchup feel, quote unquote, bad? It comes down to a really game designery concept called counterplay. Broadly speaking, counterplay is a concept which is difficult to really define, but relatively easy to describe. So let's start with a description first, and then try to arrive at a definition. In a multiplayer game, the impact of a particular game action is felt not just by the person who took that game action, but also the player who is on the receiving end. Taking a very basic example, consider the red shell in Mario Kart. The player who has the red shell fires the projectile which will seek out the next player ahead of them in the race, and the shell will detonate after striking a single target, causing them to crash and bringing them to a stop. The play of a red shell is that it provides the player with the shell a chance to knock out an opposing player who is ahead of them in the race and get ahead. But the player who is ahead of them has a very different experience. They suddenly crash, often with little to no warning. But most versions of Mario Kart allow the player who's being targeted by a red shell a degree of agency in protecting themselves, the most basic of which is having red or green shells of your own, which will allow you to block an incoming shell. And particularly skilled players could even use the layout of the track, or even other racers, to force the shell to hit another obstacle and miss. This is counterplay, the meaningful options a player has to respond to the game actions taken against them by another player. The inverse of this would be playing against an opponent with a sniper rifle in a poorly designed first-person shooter map. If the map is designed in such a way that a sniper can fire with impunity from their perch, if there's no real meaningful choice that their opponents can make to counter that strategy, that's poor counterplay. Or, think about a fighting game with a move that is impossible to interrupt, has massive reach, and also opens up an easy multi-hit combo. Again, an example of poor counterplay. The person a game action is being used against has little in the way of agency to play against it or play around it. This is usually the feeling that someone will be struggling with after a commander game that didn't go well for them instead of a hard-fought battle between equals where one deck ultimately came out on top. Good counterplay provides lots of agency to everyone at the table, which many content creators in the commander community have noted to be one of the keys to good-feeling games. Instead of... I felt like my deck couldn't do anything, or my deck just never got going, or it seemed like that deck was set up to stop me from being able to do anything. Now that we have a rough working definition for counterplay, we can start to use this to understand what exactly makes for a bad matchup. And basically, our bad matchups are going to be ones where our deck in particular is going to have more limited counterplay than it would otherwise often to such a degree that it limits your ability to just have fun playing the game. 
One of the most common causes of a bad matchup is when there is a significant difference in the critical turn that players were expecting sitting down to the pod. This is often what the general commander population would regard as a bad matchup, or often a power level mismatch. One deck at the table is significantly faster, with a much quicker critical turn. They may be running more fast mana than the other players, or have a lot more tutors to assemble their win condition too quickly for the other decks to handle. By having that earlier critical turn, and by closing out the game before the other players are ready to interact, a particularly optimized deck might rob other players of agency by acting before they have enough resources available to be able to really have any options to use for counterplay against their game plan. Another common reason why a game might feel like a bad matchup is if a player's commander directly invalidates another deck's game plan. For example, Anna Fens of the Foremost has the ability, if a creature card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exiled instead. Which directly prevents graveyard-centric strategies like Reanimator or Aristocrats decks relying on self-recurring creatures like Bloodgast for being able to play the game without first answering Anafenza. This often creates an uphill battle, where the decks with a bad matchup against Anafenza will devote an inordinate amount of their answers to keeping Anafenza off the table, only to have their strategy interrupted again every time the Anafenza player has enough mana to play the commander tax again. Thus, the game becomes a series of binary decisions. The Anafenza player is just trying to cast their commander to keep the graveyard player out of the game, while the graveyard player is trying to keep the Anafenza player from using their commander. The counterplay here is all or nothing. Only one of these two players gets to execute their game plan at a time, and otherwise has to warp their entire game around finding an answer to Anafenza or ramping her back into play. A less extreme version of this is when another deck's general strategy exploits a specific weakness in your deck. A great example of this is a CDH matchup I run into fairly frequently with my Malcolm Kettis deck, Winota. I built Malcolm Kettis as a polymorph deck, which intentionally plays no creatures in the deck except for Glintorn Buccaneer to enable the deck to use any polymorph as a one-card win condition. Winota as a commander doesn't directly stop Malcolm Kettis from working, but her general game plan is to stack out the board and then snowball out of control with combat damage to win. And because Malcolm Kettis is usually open to attacks, being a polymorph deck with very few creatures available to chump block with, it often provides an opening for Winota to begin snowballing out of control. Winota wants to attack, and Malcolm Kettis is a tempting target for any attacky deck. Same logic applies to most versions of CEDH and Agila. The counterplay that I, as the polymorph deck, have access to is fairly limited, and in order to remain relevant in the pod, I need to completely shift my strategy to mulligan aggressively for sweepers to punish the attacky decks before I then get to shift gears and begin playing into Malcolm's game plan. So the real question, the reason you tuned into this episode, was to know how do you actually play against a bad matchup? I do want to say, first and foremost, that sometimes, as part of your Rule Zero conversation, it's correct to just ask somebody to switch decks. If you're at a Command Fest with your Reanimator deck as your only deck, and your opponent pulls out Anna Vens of the Foremost, you could mention, hey, this is the only deck I brought with me. If you have anything other than Anna Fenza, that might give us a better game all around during your Rule Zero pregame talk. You might also suggest players change up decks after a game when there was a significantly bad matchup that you identified in the post-game talk. But the whole point of this episode is, after all, to give you the tools to use when you find yourself in a game where you've got a bad matchup. Such as playing in a tournament or other event where switching decks isn't really an option. Fundamentally, a bad matchup changes how your deck fits into the texture of a pod. Instead of getting to be the focused aggro deck, for example, you get put into the position of playing on the defensive, playing the value deck, trying to drag the game out and stabilize against a faster, more focused opponent. And to have a better chance against a bad matchup, you should start by trying to evaluate what kind of bad matchup you're facing. If it's facing off against a significantly faster deck, it's not usually because of a power level mismatch in the way that I described above, particularly in a more structured tournament environment, but instead because someone likely has bought the turbo deck over to the pod. And experienced CDH players will tell you the best way to handle a lone turbo deck is for the other three players in the pod 
to agree to mulligan aggressively for early interaction to stop that turbo player. Then return to normal business as usual play after the turbo player's win attempts have been stopped. See also what players have learned from playing against Cody. The players of the non turbo decks agree to take on the control role at the table. Make sure that everybody has responses to the fast win attempt, and then ultimately shift back to normal after stopping that turbo win attempt. If instead you're facing off against a commander who reigns on your parade, it's time to start making some hard decisions and some careful analysis. Ask yourself when will the commander be making an appearance? This will inform your decision making particularly if you think your deck is fast enough to get in under the problematic commander. There's a big difference between to try to get in under the 6-drop commander versus trying to get under the 2-drop commander. And it's also a big difference if you need to pull off a one-time effect to execute your game plan, such as reanimating one big important creature when Anna Fence is on the other side of the table, or if you need to continuously execute on effect, such as constantly reanimating lots and lots of little creatures. Finally, if you're up against a game plan that hits upon a weakness of your deck, if not necessarily the specific commander you see across the table, follow the same steps as above. Think about what options your deck gives you for counterplay. If you're in a creature light deck and an opponent is going to be taking an aggressive creature beats game plan, you should prioritize hands which can answer multiple creatures at once. If, on the other hand, you're worried about a stacks deck with enchantments like Rule of Law, you'd better make sure you have the ability to remove those enchantments. Basically, play to your outs, adopting a defensive or reactive or value approach, and then switch gears once you've neutralized the threat to your game plan. When it's a commander who you're concerned about, like Anna Fenza, it can be tough. You may have to answer over and over again, switching gears back and forth from reactive to proactive. It's not going to be easy but it can be rewarding if you pull it off successfully. So what about you? Have you had any bad matchups that taught you some really important lessons, whether about Commander in general or about your particular deck? Let us know about them in the comments. You can find us on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mind Podcast. You can add us on Twitter, where we are at GemstoneMindMTG. Or you can send us an email, GemstoneMindPodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mind.